everyone for being here. My name is Jessica Trevisano. I'm the senior strategist in Mayor Bibb's office, focusing on Westside Market. We are here for In the Market for Accessibility. It is uh, the next topic in our speaker series where we're focusing on all sorts of different ways that the market can impact the community. Uh, before I launch into the introduction and introduce our speakers, uh, I wanted to introduce Kristen Warsoka from the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. That's the space that we're in today to welcome us into this amazing facility. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank tonight. We were so excited when we were offered the opportunity to host this event. Um, you know, we care deeply about food access. Um, and I'll tell you personally, I'm a huge fan of the West Side Market, and I've been a fan of the West Side Market for decades. I'm a regular shopper. So um, I was excited that we could be a part of this. Um, for those of you who've not seen our new facility yet, um, we opened this space back in October. Um, it's 197,000 square feet, uh, and this is our partner distribution hub. And so the intention here is that we're taking in food from the food industry, in some cases food that might otherwise go to waste because it's surplus or have, has a packaging error or for some other reason. Um, volunteers are helping us sort and repackage it. Um, and then we're getting it out uh, to our network of 1,000 program partners in a six county service area. So as you can imagine, a lot of that food is being distributed by partners uh, right here in the city of Cleveland. Um, and we're privileged to be able to do that work. We also have a production kitchen um, where we are making about 6,000 meals every day um, for after school programs for children um, in lower income neighborhoods as well as senior programs and Meals on Wheels programs. So if you have a minute to, to peek around um, after the panel and you walk up or down this hallway, um, you'll be able to see into our kitchen, which is something we're really excited about too. Um, but I was so impressed when I saw the wonderful panel that is assembled here tonight and I know that we've got a lot of friends in the room from Barry, um, who's been in front of the food bank for a long time, Carrie Carpenter, who served on our board and is now on the um, West Side Market Board, and many others. Um, I do want to introduce Rod McGuire, who is our VP of Food Resources. Raise your hand, Rod. <laughs> so if you have questions about anything tonight, um, please, please don't hesitate to ask. And thank you so much for all you're doing for our community um, and for being a great partner. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank staff for helping us set up. They've been so easy to work with, and this is a, a great facility that we're really lucky to have. Uh, I have a whole list of thank yous to get through really quickly, so before I turn it over, uh, thank you to Elena Caruso from Home Pantry for doing our amazing catering. Uh, the food today all comes from Westside Market, so we have Kate's Fish, Jacob's Oasis, J&J &J Meats. Uh, Rita's for the olives, the cheese shop, A1 quality produce, Ohio City pasta, Riley's, and of course Home Pantry represented on the table. In our previous events, people have been like, tell us where the food is from. We have to be able to go buy it. Uh, so In the Market is a series where we are here to talk about the various ways that uh, West Side Market and public markets can have impacts on our community. As some of you may know, the West Side Market is in the process of making a really important transition from being both city-owned and city-operated to still being city-owned but being nonprofit operated. And with that comes a lot of opportunity for, to, uh, opportunity for us to think about the mission of Cleveland Public Market Corporation and West Side Market and how we can expand that mission. So uh, we've already done a couple talks. We've talked about women's entrepreneurship. Uh, we've talked about sort of the history and cultural tradition of West Side Market. We have additional talks coming up where we'll cover climate resiliency and culinary inspiration and minority entrepreneurship and equity. Uh, but tonight, we're here to talk about food access. Uh, and we have an incredible panel to talk about this uh, with us. We have people from Cleveland. We have guests from Flint, Michigan and Washington, DC, really amazing experts. Uh, who can talk to us about this topic, uh, all being led by the amazing Jennifer Lumpkin of the uh, Alliance for Great Lakes. So we're gonna do a 40 minute conversation that Jennifer is gonna moderate, and then we'll switch over to some audience questions. So if you have questions, you'll have an opportunity to ask. So with that, 
I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica, for that gracious introduction. Again, my name is Jennifer Lumpkin. I just want to thank everyone here for attending and sharing your time with us this evening. And we'll just start with introductions by each of our guests. We can start with Tanisha and then go into Morgan and then Mary and Carrie Ann. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is... Oh. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, hello, everybody. My name is Tanisha Velez, and um, I'm the owner of Cleveland Fresh, which is, which is an agriculture operation. Um, and I also am the president of a nonprofit called Jardim for Life, which in translation, Spanglish terms, it's Garden for Life. Hi everybody, good evening, afternoon, whatever we're, wherever we're at in the day. My name is Morgan Taggart, I'm the Director of FAIR, Food Access Raises Everyone. We are based here in Cleveland uh, and we do work uh, around food access. Our connection to the market is we, um, in 2021, did a revitalization plan for the market in partnership with the city, really looking at that question around access and engagement and equity at the market. Um, and have continued some of our work in partnership with some of the vendors where we did a produce perks pilot there last year. We're expanding it again this year and adding produce prescription. And I'm gonna get to share about all that in the next few uh, minutes that we have together. Hello everyone, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time in Ohio, so I'm really excited. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Mary Blackthorn. I'm the founder of Market 7. Market 7 is a community marketplace that features black-owned businesses for the purpose of alleviating food and retail deserts in Washington, D.C. We are so excited because we are opening the first black-owned food hall in Washington, D.C. history this summer, um, and we are just excited to bring more capacity to communities that really have food access issues, and we'll talk more about that today. Hi, my name is Carrie Ann Murtis, and I am um, the manager of the Flint Farmers Market in Flint, Michigan. Um, some of you may be surprised to know that um, our market has, has been around for um, since 1905. Um, the building that we're in right now, we are just coming up on our nine year anniversary, but we are a year round public market with a farmers market that is adjacent to us, so we're kind of a mixture. We also were owned by the city for the first, I don't know, until 2001. Um, and then uh, the, and the nonprofit actually took it over, called Uptown Reinvestment Corporation, which is very involved in the revitalization of downtown Flint overall. So they've managed the market now for 21 years. Um, I've been um, managing the market, um, been working with the market and managing for 17 years at the Flint Farmers Market. Um, we have about 45 year-round vendors um, and like half a million customers a year, but we're also a huge community event space where we welcome weddings and baby showers and bridal showers and community fundraisers and all kinds of festivals to our market. So I'm very um, thankful to be asked to come here today. I think there's a lot of similarities between our towns um, and potentially between our markets, and I'm very excited for um, all the exciting things that are going to be happening here in Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for introducing yourself. And we're just going to jump off with Tanisha. So I know that you're founding your first farmer's market in Roberto Clemente Park, which is super exciting. Um, and a lot of folks that I spoke to have some, some ambiguity around the difference between a public market and a farmer's market. Can you just share a little bit about your experience um, and the distinction and some of the benefits between public markets and private or farmer's markets? Um, so before we, I get there, I just want to explain like how we got to the actual farmer's market. So last year, um, we grew up in the neighborhood, and by we, I mean a couple of us uh, volunteers. Um, our children played at a baseball park called Roberto Clemente, which is the only park that is named after a Puerto Rican hero um, in Cleveland. So after seeing the park being very abandoned, uh, we decided to gather together and just ask for donations from businesses and, and just the community. And we kind of got together around $8,000 and rebuilt, revitalized the park in a way that now you can know the history of Roberto Clemente, actually sit on benches, um, and there's a beautiful mural there as well. Um, and then after we saw what we had completed in 20 weeks, we said, what's next, right? Like, what can we do here? Um, so in order for us to continue the community aspect of it, we wanted to create that gathering space to have a farmer's market as well as bring back the Roberto Clemente Baseball League. 
which I'm missing the first launch of practice today, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I had this already. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so from that, we decided to let's start a farmer's market where we're engaging a lot of Latino entrepreneurs that are launching their businesses um, from their homes, and it's like, okay, let's create this space. Um, so the difference from, for, to me between a public uh, market and a farmer's market is that um, the public market is owned by the government or by the city, um, and then they've been around for a long time. So those are just two of those things. And then the other one, for me, a farmer's <coughs> market has um, very small businesses in there, like starting off, um, especially like farmers that are in the community within a couple of miles. Um, so those are the two things for me that I think that are the differences. What we're talking about was how a farmer's market can sort of prepare someone for an on-ramp into a public market. And that can provide access in different ways. And I know, Morgan, you see accessibility in different tiers, right? So can you tell us what that accessibility can look like and how you frame out accessibility? Yes, absolutely. Um, so when I think about access and when we spent, and Full disclosure, Tanisha and I were both working on this project together at FAIR, so she also has deep knowledge. But we spent, um, yeah, a full year basically at the market, from the basement to the second floor with the vendors, Produce Arcade, Market Hall. And as we were looking at that project, it was one of the kind of main things that we were trying to approach it with was how does this become our city market? It's known as the West Side Market. For those of you who are Clevelanders, we used to have the Central Market. East Side Market, West Side Market is the true kind of public market style that's remained. Um, and there's a lot of barriers and there's a lot of neighborhoods that don't feel connected to the West Side Market. And so we really wanted to like dig into that and understand that. So I think there's things like physical accessibility, right? When you think about the West Side Market, it's right there in Ohio City, it's connected to the Rapid, bus lines, red line, on the West 25th Street corridor in Lorraine. So you can connect to that market from a, a physical space um, and transportation space. And a lot of people, it's a landmark, people know where it is. Um, so we definitely have that in our favor. But many of you know we are an east-west city, east side, west side, uh, coming over that bridge, we know is a, a physical barrier for people, right? And it's historical. Um, and so that is a barrier, I think, for us. When we were talking with customers at the west side market, we did focus groups. We kind of actually intentionally chose not to focus on Ohio City. We talked to folks in Clark Fulton, in the Central community, in the Buckeye community, in the Mount Pleasant community. What would connect you to that market? Do you shop there now? If you don't, why not? What do you need to see there? And I think that really kind of showed us access through a different lens. It's not just location, right? It's how you feel when you're in that space. Do you feel welcome in that space? Do you see other people like you in that space? And that was some of the feedback. So it also comes to kind of culture and environment access. Do I feel uh, like that space is for me. And then when we talk about food access, it's really around access to healthy food. And we know we have neighborhoods, thank goodness for the work Tanisha's doing to really bring that market into her community because they have a, I won't mention names, but they have a not great grocery store that's operating there now. And we know that community members want other options for fresh, affordable food. Um, so in addition to that healthy kind of food access piece that I think the West Side Market brings to the city and the region, because uh, it's really, for those of you who are in the food world, we would talk about it as a food hub in, in kind of local food speak, right? This is where a lot of food is being aggregated, it comes into our community, and then it goes out. And a lot of those relationships are direct to consumer, to folks like you and me who can shop there, but there's also kind of wholesale opportunities there too. Um, and then that last kind of pillar is really around economic access. Um, I've been, we've been preparing for the Produce Perks launch for this year, which is on Saturday. Uh, 8 a.m., I have flyers, come see me after if you know anyone who wants to be there. Um, and I can t talk a little bit more about that, but you know, talking to the produce vendors, watermelons are going for 20 bucks right now. And so when we talk about economic access, we talk about inflation, the effect on families whose wages have not increased at the same rate as inflation, we have a real barrier in terms of Cleveland families being able to access the produce at the West Side Market and all of the other foods there. And so kind of when I think about that, those are some of the elements. It, it is about healthy food access, but it's about all these other factors too that really influence how, uh, how we relate to that market as a source for produce in our community and all sorts of other fresh local foods. 
Thank you, Morgan. That's really helpful and expansive of what accessibility means. And I'm going to pass it to Mary because I have a personal experience with Mary as a black producer in Washington, D.C., Maryland area. And she was one of the first markets to bring me in as a producer in an area that was very heavily food insecure. And so I just want to pass it to you and then over to you, um, Carrie Ann, as well. But can you talk to us about that accessibility and culturally relevant inclusion into how you ran your market? I guess I'm just going to jump into the Market 7 spiel. Um, and while I, why I really started the market, it was because I was hungry, right? I lived in a community, and I could not get access to the sort of foods that I wanted in community. I graduated from college, and I moved back home. And I became a vegetarian because I'm like, I'm going to be more healthy. I'm an adult now. I have to do the right thing. And I quickly realized that my community did not have access to the sort of foods that I needed. We had three grocery stores at the time east of the river. It's two wards with 160,000 residents, 95% um, African American, and we only had three grocery stores. Now just to put this in context, there are single wards that are predominantly white in Washington, D.C., 12 grocery stores, half as many people, walkable, all of them. And so I found myself leaving my community and going to other communities just to get access to fresh and sustainable foods. Because the grocery stores that we did have, they were dilapidated, the produce was bad. And so I was like, okay, I have to leave and get food. But when I was adding up my Uber cost at the end of the month, my goodness, um, it was getting expensive. And I'm like, okay, I have a food bill and then I have a food Uber bill. Um, and for someone who just graduated from college, that's a lot. And I'm like, is everybody dealing with this? Is this a, is this a thing? And what people were doing, they were leaving or they were dealing with the circumstances that were in our community. Um, and so that was a huge access issue for me because I was just like, there has to be models where people are actually in community and getting access to the foods that they need, but we're not like bogged down by this idea that if your area of medium income is too low, then you don't get grocery stores, you know, which is what was coming back to us as a community. And so, you know, I thought about my time in Ghana because I used to, I did a teaching program in Ghana when I was in uh, college, and I saw how communities came together that weren't rich, that didn't have BMWs everywhere, but they had autonomy of their communities through these centralized marketplaces. And I said, you know what, we can do something very similar here. We can bring together people of the community, people who reflect the community, um, black-owned businesses that are farmers, that have lifestyle products that are providing packaged food goods. And we can create alternative marketplaces in communities. And so over the past almost six years now, we've worked with 100 black-owned businesses um, in the DC area to do these alternative pop-up markets in many different forms. Um, and this is kind of the genesis of what now is like, again, the first black-owned food hall in Washington, DC, um, and bringing in eight new businesses that are reflective of community, but then also giving space to have shelf equity where it didn't really exist. So part of that is being in community, working with black-owned businesses that are doing that work in this market, and then also making sure that we have scalable opportunities for those businesses so they can stay in community. So for instance, we have a partnership with Whole Foods to get more black-owned businesses in shelves and on shelves in communities that what we always face in DC is the big G, gentrification, right? Communities that used to be black, communities that used to be people of color, and now there's Whole Foods on the corner and nobody can afford to shop there. You know, how do we get in those marketplaces and make sure that we're reflected on those shelves and that people recognize the foods and people see themselves because that's how we get a healthy community. Right now, people that live in Ward 7 and Ward 8, they die up to 16 years earlier than their counterparts that live in those communities on the other side of the river that have all of those grocery stores due to diabetes and things like heart disease. Things that can be changed in part or all together through a change of diet. So that's what we're really trying to get to is a place of equity in our marketplaces and we're creating opportunities and like economic enclaves at the intersection of health, sustainable health and sustainable economics that makes it possible for black people to survive. Thank you, I like that spiel. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And I think, Carrie Ann, you wanted to touch upon um, what access looks like on the producer side at the Flint Fresh Food Hub and also some of the prescription kids offerings that you provide for women, in, um, infant, and children. Yeah, so in our market, uh, like I said, we're right in the heart of downtown Flint. Uh, the market's already always been in Flint, but we moved maybe three quarters of a mile, which was a super big deal to people. Um, because it was much loved, much like your market here. Like any changes, it is very concerning to people because they have so many memories um, that go along with that. So, um, but when one of the big um, pluses about moving right in the heart of downtown is that Flint is also seeing a, a 
pretty big rebirth of um, people living downtown Flint again, which was gone for a long time. So there's a lot of different um, multi-level housing that is um, mixed income that we've been working on getting downtown. We're also right next to the MTA, the big bus station downtown. So, so access in terms of being able to actually get there and not having to take, it's, you can just go to the main to the main MTA hub, you can get your groceries and then go back if you were um, someone that was using that system. We also are very lucky in our community um, with some amazing foundations, family foundations, and some of them are among the biggest in the nation, um, but then we also have some local ones too. And so um, Flint has had a lot of struggles, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news. Um, and so as a, as a Go Flint person, it's, it's <laughs> we're always on trying to you know, kind of paint a different picture of Flint. But one thing that's really amazing is the nonprofits in our community and all of the community agencies that help people. They really came together and, and we we take a, a sort of a, um, an attitude of if someone comes in and says, well, what if we, can we try this at your market? Yes, like it's always yes. And so what we've done is we've been able to create some really wonderful food access programs to help people in our community that are underserved. Obviously, SNAP, EBT is a, is a nationwide thing. We're very, very um, been involved. I've had the opportunity to speak multiple times about the Farm Bill um, in, in front of some folks that it's, it's really huge for our market. But there's also the Double Up Food Bucks programs, which I think Morgan is going to talk about, too. Um, we were a national pilot for that. Um, we also have a program that's called, um, I call it Prescriptions for Health. I think they fancied it up and they're calling it RX Kids now. But um, it's pretty great. Our market, interestingly, um, has two floors. M most of the business is on, everything is on the main floor. Our offices are on the second floor. And then the Hurley Children's Center, um, there's a specialty clinic. If any of you followed the water crisis in Flint, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha was the woman that you saw quite frequently. Um, her. Her door is from where I am to the cameraman, probably away for her office. So that's actually located right in our market. So that was pretty interesting for us to be sort of at the center of that in terms of being able to help um, once things um, kind of came out. And so the Prescriptions for Health is, is an opportunity when parents bring their kids to the children's clinic, they get a, a literal prescription. It looks like a handwritten, like a doctor's prescription, um, and it's for fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market. It's pretty great. Um, and they've extended out into many women and children's clinics, and now I think we have about five or six different ones um, in terms of that. Um, it, it's a lot of work. It, it's a lot of tracking, um, and it's definitely intentional for us to continue to do that, but it also um, presents other opportunities where people know that we're open to doing that, even though we have a super small staff. Um, but we had, for example, the Detroit Pistons, the National Basketball Players Association came to us um, shortly after the water crisis and they partnered with the Detroit Pistons and they gave all Flint school kids $30 of market gift cards at, on their last day of school and then uh, the Basketball Association did and then the Pistons matched it so the kids got to come down and shop and buy food and learn about it. It was really wonderful. It's a great interaction um, between our vendors and the kids, but kind of accessibility always being open to, I don't think we've ever said nah, even though if it's like, oh boy, this is going to be a lot more paperwork or whatever, but in our community, you've got you've to gotta keep saying yes to get that out there. So the other piece of it um, is um, we, are, we struggle, we are, we are a public market, um, but we also are known as a farmer's market, so it's kind of, there's like a duality there, and everybody always wants to see more farmers. Um, things changed so much during COVID, um, and what ended up happening, which is great for the farmers, is that they just started selling at their farms, which makes more sense for them. And people found a way to get to their farm and find their farm. And so they were able to do, do, do just as well, not having to pay for gas and pay for staffing and stand down at our market in the hot sun three days a week. And so what started happening um, was good for them, but maybe not so great for like a customer experience at the market. Um, so this really interesting um, organization that we partner with is called the Flint Fresh Food Hub. Um, and it is a, it's a food aggregate space. And so what we finally got smart after multiple summers of trying to recruit new farmers and new farmers in, um, they have a really great um, 
kind of outreach, and I think they have like, gosh, I don't know, I think they have like 50 small growers from our county in, in neighboring counties. And so they, they got a bus, similar to like a food truck, they got, a, they got funding for it, and they turned it into a mobile um, farmer's market. They have actually two of them. So they actually pull up to our market with about nine or ten different farmers, small farmers that may not have the resources to, to stand outside all day, not have like that much of a yield. But they, they aggregate it, they come down, they flip open the sides and the top, and they put the tables out, and it's like just a immediate farmer's market. It's really great. Um, they're doing amazing things. They also go into the communities. They do food boxes. Um, but all of it's, you know, locally sourced as much as possible. And so we kind of figured out a way to sort of make all that happen. And we do have some actual farmers and some that, are, that come on their own independently. But that was kind of, I don't know, that may be the way that, that it's going. And it may be something even here that ends up working out. Yeah, food aggregation is a big topic in the ecosystem and figuring out how um, we can leverage this opportunity with the West Side Market. And that just goes into my next question. So how is a public market a conduit for all the possibilities? Because we're going to do everything at the West Side Market, right? How is it a conduit for all the possibilities in the city and for the residents of the city and folks that visit us from all over the world? And I can start with you or you or whoever wants to go first. Um, so you're asking how does it benefit other, okay. Um, so for right now, just because we have so many cold days in Cleveland, um, I partnered with one of the vendors, um, Tom Boutros from Boutros Brothers, and we actually purchase some vegetables from them and we resell it at the market. Um, we kind of don't break even just because it's such a new market, but he helps me get things that are um, culturally appropriate for where my market's sitting at. So we get juca, we get platanos, we get avocados, we get mangoes. Um, and people see that and they're like, oh my God, like this is amazing, right? Um, and then we also just, uh, you know, we also let them know about different programs that are happening at the West Side Market, like what Morgan's bringing there, um, because this is how we create that ecosystem and then that food aggregation or or distribution piece of it, um, where they're purchasing the vegetables and then they have somewhere else to give to or to like sell to, um, and then we're able to bring it to the community. And then when they do ask, like, where can I get this pepper from or where do I get this from, we point them to the market. Um, so it's just that way of that partnership that we could work together to just bring more people to the farmer's market because it's more local or bring, or you know, send people to the West Side Market where it's just more, more appropriate stuff. Like it's just, yeah, it's just a lot more, yeah. So it's just creating that relationship. Um, and then also as a producer myself, I'm able to, you know, bring the microgreens to him and he's able to sell it for my, for my business. So it helps out. Yeah, I think um, there's a couple ways I think it could, we could even expand its impact in Cleveland. Um, so one of, and if you'll indulge, indulge me for a second, back in 2009, we'll take the hot tub time machine, back then, <laughs> Westside Market Cafe, Gun Foundation, myself, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland City Council member, and the Director of Public Health for the City of Cleveland had breakfast and dreamed up what became the Produce Perks Program in Ohio. And sitting at that table, how can we provide some incentives um, that can really help families who have limited budgets access fresh, affordable local food. Um, and that whole project and initiative took off in Cleveland, then across the state, but it had never been done at the West Side Market until last year. Um, and I think to me, that's, you know, I think one of the exciting things to be able to see that program grow. We, uh, and one of the recommendations that we made in our uh, revitalization plan was really, how do you get the, the uh, Produce Perks program at the West Side Market? And I actually had a very long conversation, maybe a couple with the Finley Market Manager to talk about how they did it at their market. Because I think one of the challenges is, and what's different that a farmer's market can do is they can run everything kind of centralized through the market management so all of the vendors can participate. We're at the West Side Market, people are individually signing up for SNAP and EBT. Um, and so we then kind of stepped in to serve as that um, clearinghouse so we can form relationships with all those vendors and reimburse them. So last year we piloted it in partnership with Produce Perks Midwest um, and distributed about, I think, close to $36,000 worth of coupons in two uh, days at the market. Um, 
families can come to the market, they get screened right there, and then we give them uh, booklets worth $240 to spend on fresh produce at the market over the next seven weeks. Uh, it's a statewide program. It's funded actually through the, the state TANF budget. But I got to brag because that's what we do in Cleveland. Actually, we don't do that, and we should do it more. Um, you know, the, the statewide level is 55% of those coupons actually get spent. Do you know what we did here? 98% of those coupons came back and were spent at that market. Um, but to me, it really comes to design, right? Like, how did we design that program? We designed that program, the two of us, um, really thinking about the families that we wanted to benefit program, the benefit from the program, as well as the vendors. So what do the vendors need? They need to be reimbursed pretty quickly uh, from a business perspective. So how can we make that happen? They need signage at their stands. We really talked to them about how can we design this so it works for you? And then we talked with our team and said, how do we design this so the families that are meant to benefit really enjoy themselves? We kind of engaged in some radical hospitality. So when they walked into that market, they saw balloons, they heard music. We had a cooking demo. So even though people were waiting in line, they were having a good time. They brought their kids. We had like a whole roll of brown paper and kids were coloring and leaving us all sorts of messages. So it's not just popping up and doing a program. You need to design it with who you want to benefit and bring those people in to design it with you. So our team, community team, that was screening folks that day, we, I think we had about seven or eight of us, some of those folks have experienced those bureaucratic processes themselves as folks who've accessed SNAP or WIC. And so having those folks talking people through what it just takes to kind of patiently enter all that information and then go to the next screen, go to the next screen, uh, I think that's really important. And so from our perspective, having the folks that are most affected by something engaged in it is, I think, yeah, it's kind of what you have to do in order to really have the impact that you'd like to have. This year, in addition to Produce Perks, we're also at, at, um, adding a new program, Produce Prescription, in partnership with the Cleveland Clinic. That's also a first one uh, that we've had at the West Side Market. This is uh, focused on patients at the Cleveland Clinic that are either pre-diabetic or have been di diagnosed with diabetes. Um, they'll get up to $150, depending on their household side to spend, size to spend at the market uh, over the course of six months. So this is another opportunity. We're kind of using that same system that we built in terms of relationships with the produce vendors to get another uh, opportunity for families to shop at the West Side Market and use that fresh produce uh, in order to kind of address some of their, um, yeah, chronic disease and conditions. I like that the diabetes correspondence with the actual, like, incentive. Yeah. The $150, yep. I like that a lot. Um, I want to ask you both, uh, Mary and Carrie Ann, are there unique opportunities that have come up that you didn't expect um, and that you were sort of, like, surpri pleasantly surprised by through running your markets? Yeah, well, yeah, every day. It seems like there, there's something. I never know, like, every day is different. Someone comes into our office. Um, I think one thing that I, I wanted to jump on, and it was a unique opportunity for the Double Up Food Bucks program, which is a matching incentive with SNAP EBT. Our market, interestingly, and um, so we, we, our vendors have to be their own SNAP person. So I don't handle any of the, the EBT funds back to them. But we do do the double up food bucks, and it does make it it's so much easier. But what we did that was different, in Michigan, um, all of our markets, um, when people use SNAP EBT or double up bucks, they use uh, tokens. Um, that's how they, they trade them in. We've never done that in our market um, on purpose. Uh, we went electronic even before it was really very efficient, but we did it anyway. Um, and I think it goes to what you were just saying about, you know, so many people are, are caught up in the red tape and it's a pain and they're always waiting in line and you're always having to wait. And so we wanted to create a situation where it feels good to come and spend that money at the farmer's market. And you can be proud to come in. And in a situation where you have other people going like, hey, it, what's that card? Like, how come I want that card? And, and it really, like, you asked me before what I'm most proud of about our market, and I would say my many years there, and this started with um, the gentleman that was before me when we worked together, um, it really helped cut down on the stigma of people that need food assistance um, by giving an opportunity to just 
swipe the card, just like everybody else. And the person behind you doesn't know if it's a credit card or a debit card or a gift card or who knows what it is. And so it was hard. We stuck to it. We got through all the bumps of you know, technology, blessings, and curses. But we did that. And, and um, to see people have that experience and bring their kids and be proud to come and get things um, for their families, that is, is probably, of all the things, that I'm probably most proud of. Um, we also do get a lot of interesting things because Flint has a lot of challenges. And so they are, we are also blessed by a lot of opportunity, like I mentioned with the, the Detroit Pistons and, and a lot of other um, things. We, we, um, we benefit from being a community place where people want to want to come and visit and bring friends and bring associates and have conferences. And so um, I think the other thing to mention real quick too is just our market is um, when we moved, we didn't used to have this. So, so before 10 years ago in our old market, we really just had a gallery t st style, it was similar to your produce hall. But it was, it was a variety of vendors, but it was very similar to that. So one thing we made sure that we did was create several big event spaces to have those big community events because that brings all kinds of new people to the market. And it also allows different parts of our community to come in and use the market that it, when it doesn't really have anything to do with the market, but it brings people there and they, they enjoy it, they bring their family, they have a good time there. So that was um, a really interesting um, opportunity. The other piece of it is, um, in addition to that Flint Fresh Food Hub thing, we also have two commercial kitchens and they're production kitchens, they're, they're we also have a demonstration kitchen, but they're incubator kitchens. And so that's been a really fantastic journey of entrepreneurship. So people come in, and it's, fine. it's taken almost 10 years, but it's finally working, where we had a family come in. Um, they are from Venezuela, husband and wife, came in and said, I'm, we, make, we make pork sandwiches. They're kind of like Cuban sandwiches, but they're Venezuelan, and, I, and we want to sell them here. And so I immediately got my counterpart who runs the kitchens. And he, I said, they're going to do it. Like, people come in all the time and say they want to do stuff, but not everybody can, you know, not everybody follows through, but I was like, this is exciting, they're gonna do this. And so he was able to um, get them through the food testing by um, letting her, her do the test in Spanish. She was able to make all, like kind of get over all of these sort of barriers for them. And um, they started out cooking in our kitchens, taking it outside to our outdoor pavilion, because we didn't have an indoor spot. Everyone loved them, all the other vendors eat there. I don't know about you guys, but like, you watch where the vendors eat in the market, that's where you want to go, because they, and everybody loved them. And then we, we were actually, we made like a bunch of moves this year um, because of people retiring, and we were able to give them their own spot. We just grand opened the place, and they've been sold out every day for three weeks with their sandwiches. But to have that sort of opportunity, come in, I got an idea, I know how to do this, how can I do this, and to have that Food Works program there that kind of walks them through the whole process of licensing and how do you, you know, get an LLC and figure out how you're going to do your payroll and just, you know, really get them to a point of, of having a really <coughs> legit business. That's been a, that was a very, um, again, it's taken almost 10 years to see that happen. There's, we right now have, I think, three outdoor vendors um, that were using our kitchens, they're setting up outside and then eventually they'll be inside. So it's kind of a really neat step up when it works. Yeah. Thank you. I think for us, um, this, I don't know, I'm, I'm just very passionate about my community because mm -hmm. like, I live where I'm from and it's so special to me. Um, and to see us go through what is in fact the food apartheid, which is a long history of discriminatory practices against communities of color, particularly black people in this country around food and housing and workforce opportunities, um, to see us kind of build this movement around food and getting healthy that is so transformative in our community. And so just to be a part of things like the food walk that we did, where we, I don't know if you were there, we did the food walk in Ward 8 to advocate for more food justice east of the river, more monies putting into um, marketplaces, getting more grocery stores. How can we support more black owned businesses that are providing food? I'm just so happy to be a part of that conversation. Um, I think one really dynamic thing that happened where we were able to give voice to some of our vendors was we were a recipient of the Healthy Food Financing Initiatives out of the USDA. Um, and they are giving over $200 million to different um, businesses and organizations across the country um, that are doing food justice work, putting markets in communities, trying to transform this food access issue. Um, and they made the big announcement at Market 7, since I guess, because we're local, right? 
Um, they did the make the announcement there, but then also um, Senator McGovern and uh, representatives from the government came over and wanted to have a community talk with our community about what was what we were going through, what was going to happen, what were some of our solutions, and to have that round table and put our businesses at the forefront, put our partners at the forefront and say, hey, this is what we're going through. This is what we actually need to see work. This is how the government can get more involved. This is policy that we need to be able to stage that right where our market is. Um, it was like our first little event, and it was so cool to just see them speak truth to power, um, and that's what we're all about. Uh, probably second was one day just sitting at home, um, I got a call, and it was from a very famous house, the White House. Um, and they called and said, you know, Mary, we think you'd be great to talk at the White House conference on hunger, health, and nutrition. Um, and that was last September, um, and I never thought, how did they even get your number? They must have seen you. But, called me and wanted me to talk about what was going on in our community, how Market 7 was working to really create dynamic change around food justice in Washington, D.C., um, what this new market was going to be, and how public-private partnerships were working in dynamic ways in communities to create systematic change, and to be able to talk about Ward 7 on a national stage and what we were doing and bringing the power of all 70,000 of us that live there, work there, laugh there, cry there, heal there, and say that this is what we're going through this is what we need on a national stage. That's something I never thought would happen. And so, so powerful for me and for us, and I'm just so appreciative to have that opportunity. That sounds amazing, and thank you for stepping up and doing that. Thank you. So I think we're going to wrap up and go to questions, mm -hmm. and then we can come back and get last remarks from everyone on the panel. All right, cool. Does anybody have any questions? So we're in this beautiful facility here, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, which has a lot of really sophisticated community programs. And I'm wondering if each of you are working with the food banks in your area and, and how you kind of complement those kind of food access services with your food banks. Okay, so I'll go. Um, so no, I haven't yet. Um, and I think the reason for me not getting that partnership yet is because we want to increase revenue in the businesses, so we want the producers to create more revenue. Um, I'm not sure how the food bank fits into that because we also want like the most nutritional produce for um, the community. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that fits into the partnership that I'm looking for yet, um, but I don't see how it would fit later on and as we grow as a market, so. Yeah, I think, um, for us, we've worked with them in terms of SNAP outreach. And so when we are at the West Side Market, we also have them there to help people who um, may not be already signed up for SNAP, sign up for SNAP. Um, but we really haven't forged, I think, a partnership beyond that at this point. Um, it, I mean, as Tanisha alluded to, it's a tricky dynamic in our communities. Um, they're, it's really challenging because we have, and I think from Fair's perspective and others' perspective, we also want to create opportunities for people to build wealth as food entrepreneurs, as urban producers, as urban growers. And um, the food bank and pantries and meal programs become the, almost a silent competitor in the food access space in our neighborhoods. And so I think we, and, and to be honest, there is often a division between folks who are working in charitable food system and people who are working on food justice and food access. Um, and we haven't really formed those partnerships. Um, and I think, you know, as we continue to lose grocery stores in Cleveland, um, sounds very similar to DC, we continue to lose grocery stores, there is a uneasy dynamic in terms of our markets, in terms of the role that food pantries serve versus retail um, entrepreneurs serve in that space. And I don't think that we've gotten there yet in terms of how we can work um, in more dynamic ways and complementary ways and really looking at some new models because I think that's the challenge for Cleveland. I think I've had a couple convers. I'm very concerned about access to healthy food from a retail perspective. Um, and been working with residents in a couple different communities in the Central neighborhood, in the Euclid Beach, Collinwood neighborhood, who've lost Dave's grocery stores in the last few years, and there's a tremendous pressure in the grocery industry, right, to adjust. Um, but I think it's around how do we then make a viable option in those communities that's not the food bank? 
And I think that's the big question. And I think we almost need to accept, and I've had a couple conversations recently that supermarkets aren't coming back for now, and we gotta do something different. We gotta shake things up. And so another kind of Westside Market connection for us is we work with uh, corner convenience stores. My colleague T is in the back. Uh, she's doing some great work in Central Kinsman with some of our small, um, own stores, and so we're working with, but we have like a misfit with scale, right? We have the Central Community Lobster Grocery Store, yet that is the location of the produce terminal. Like, that's crazy. That should not be that way. And so, but the scale of the produce terminal does not fit the small store format. It's not at the price point, it's not at the scale, so we're working with vendors at the West Side Market to put together mixed boxes for the small stores to purchase, because right now they're going to Sam's Club, buying food and then marking it up, which is also why it's more expensive. Um, so I think in terms of using it, and you were talking about this with some of the, that food hub concept, how do we use the West Side Market as an aggregator that is at scale with which our smaller stores could really work with and benefit from that then benefits our communities? And then how do we integrate urban growers and urban agriculture into that aggregation system as well? Because uh, that's, I think, another dynamic to this is locally grown versus internationally grown, right? That's another uneasy tension that we have in this like food justice, food access space. So long answer, Carrie, but I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, to work together because we all, I think at the end of the day, would, even if it's way out there, have the same goal. Um, but we just have different ways, theories of change. Um, and kind of values that are driving us on how we get there, but I think there's opportunity for us to do more together. That was very helpful, thank you. Um, so, quick question. I guess going off of what you were saying, um, as far as uh, the farmers, benefiting the farmers, um, do you offer the West Side Market offer uh, for some farmers that don't have staff to, for them to drop off their produce and they get their commission then or not? Because, you know, every farmer can't sit at the market um, or has the capability to pay anyone. I may miss that. Yeah, I think that there's opportunity for various ways to accommodate vendors. But I, I'll ask you, Jessica, um, if you have an answer, a specific answer, a definitive answer? I mean, for me, as a producer myself, I do microgreens. Um, so what I do is I speak with the individual vendors, the ones that I would want to have that partnership with, um, and then see if they want to buy it from me and then push, you know, like sell it. And then we both make some money. So I give them what is my price as a wholesaler, right? And then they sell it up a little bit just to make their revenue as well. Um, so that's just my recommendation is, Probably walk through the market and see like who's the vendor you want to have that partnership and that's grow that relationship your with. Relationship building, not the West Side Market. Okay. I'm sorry. That's your relationship building, but not the West Side Market helping yeah, the personal relationship. Yeah, it's just with the vendor because uh, the West Side Market is the building, right? Is just the facility, and then it's like the um, it's with the vendor that you would want to have that relationship to to push the product. But Jessica, I don't know if you have another a better question. It's, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it is a challenge with West Side Market because the way that the rent structure is right now is you have to be there at least four days a week, and that's forty hours, and a lot of people can't do that. Um, so the way that some markets have kind of solved for that is they'll do day stall programs where they have just like a weekend where somebody could pop up or do a short period of time. Uh, but I think you know as we're making this transition with West Side Market. These are the types of conversations that we're having because we want to think about how to make the market more accessible. Quick, one more quick question. So I am from Detroit, and I'm not sure if they have a program where the farmers, they take all their produce to one location, they give them a percentage of their sales, and they sell it at the East Side Market. Is that true, do you know? At the Eastern Market? Eastern Market? Market. Eastern market? <clears throat> I'm not... I'll, Eastern Market is a, is a very interesting place. Um, it is it is a public market, but it's I don't it's it's not the same. Not the same yeah, um, you know I don't know if they do, but I what I was gonna say is what the the food hub, the food mobile truck thing. <clears throat> what we've been able to do is as we've grown this partnership, is all of our local growers that come in, it, we immediately hook them up with the food hub guy. 
And so what he does, which is pretty great, um, is our vendors that actually come and stand at the market at the end of the day, he, he comes to the market and buys everything else that they have left at the end of the day that they grew and then they put it in their produce boxes for the upcoming days. So it, it's taken, again, like I said, this is a, kind of a work in progress that we've f finally gotten to, but, but that's what he does. People bring it in, he pays them directly when they drop it off for what they give them and, and then you would drop off your tomatoes and be on your way and then he takes care of the rest of it. So um, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool project. They funded that. Um, they got multiple grants. I think some were federal grants, some were state grants, some were foundation grants. Um, so they were able to really build a good kind of nest egg to be able to make that happen for the farmers. And I think it's, it's really worked out well. And just FYI, Dana is a local poultry farmer. She raises chickens here in Cleveland. So hopefully we'll see her chickens at the Westside Market soon. <laughs> I think we have time for one more audience question, if anybody has one. Hello, the question is for Market 7. Okay, when I think about the West Side Market and food accessibility in Cleveland, I just think of East Side, West Side. Because like you said, Uber costs and transportation costs. And I do hear about benefits for SNAP and EBT, but anyone who doesn't benefit from, from produce perks and they live on the east side, the west side market is not local. So in Detroit, do you guys have multiple locations or one building that all of these people can eat from? The, the eastern market in Detroit is one, it's like a, it's like a city, <laughs> if you've seen it before. Um, and so they have, um, again, I can't speak to all their programs, but yeah, they, they have kind of a, um, it's like, one-stop shop they have everything like we have vendors from our market that are resellers that go to Eastern Market and buy their produce from Eastern Market and bring it and sell it at our farmers market of the resellers but there's some other in Michigan there are a couple areas like Grand Rapids on the west side of our state they have multiple markets like within communities that are sort of offshoots of the main market we just have in Flint we just have our one spot um, but partnering with that kind of um, food truck on the road um, helps get it into the communities, if that helps. Gina, was your question for Market 7? Mary's with Market 7. Yeah, I was just wondering how they did it. When she talked about the Uber costs and the amount of people with no grocery stores, how do you, like, I'm not understanding, how did you do it? Like, is it one location or is it pop-up location? So, well, we weren't, oh. There we go. Uh, when we were in pop-up capacity, we popped up all over Ward 7 because another thing we deal with with gentrification is like space is limited, right? Because people are buying it up and keeping it to themselves. And so we're popping up in, where were we? We were at a club parking lot. Yeah, so, yeah. It was a club, <laughs> club parking lot. We did our first market for 10 weeks and then we got a little dilapidated space with a busted building on it. We had to build a wall in front of it and a mural to hide the building because it, it was falling into the ground. You all, we got really creative, okay? But we popped up everywhere because we kind of had to go to people in the community, right? We had to go to where the people are because I still have to leave my community to this day to get food. Um, and so th this is the thing that like keeps me up at night. I just want to walk to the grocery store, right? And so part of our work is like, how do we make our marketplaces more accessible to people? And sometimes you have to just go to where people are. So I love like mobile markets. Um, that go around to communities through the week. We have one, we had Acadia in DC that goes around with the truck um, and they drop off produce. Uh, Market 7, we do pop-ups, we still do pop-ups from time to time. Um, that'll always be part of us, that's our genesis. Um, we're gonna have pop-ups at Market 7, we'll do pop-ups in other places in the community. Um, our food hall is stationary, of course, it's 7,000 square feet of loveliness, bringing eight new black-owned businesses to the community. So that'll be stationary, so if you all are ever in DC, uh, past this summer, please come through. Um, but yeah, we're gonna continue to do to do different things and like go to different places because we find that we have to go to people because those things are, just don't exist in community. Awesome. Well, thanks. If anybody wants to give final remarks, and then yeah, we were gonna just give final. Rem Did you have one more question? Okay. You sure? Yeah. Well, you can ask, and then we can get final remarks, and it might include answers to your question. Um, so my question is: Is there maybe some? 
type of marketing plan to um, highlight certain communities. So we have the Latino community, we have the black community. So it sounds like we need to connect with um, the culturally relevant vendors to say, hey, we have you know this over here and we have that over there so that um, different ones can come and say, hey, oh yeah, I can relate to these foods or I have this or that. Um, that may be um, a strategy to let people know what's there and why they should come. Um, because if it's something there that they know about, if she knows me and you know this person, you're gonna go get those specialty foods, right? Because you like them, you can relate to them. So um, somehow marketing and highlighting um, those various vendors. Thank you, thank you. And I wanna just give you all a chance to share last remarks before we just close out. Last remarks? I mean, I'll, I'll plug mine in. Um, so every Saturday from 10 to 1, we'll have the Cleveland Fresh Farmers Market at 3690 Seymour, which is the Roberto Clemente um, Park. And starting June 3rd, every Saturday, moving all the way till August, you can catch a little league baseball game. So just in case you want to see little kids running around bases and playing with dirt in the outfield, that'll be the spot. And then we're also looking for vendors. So if anybody that's interested in trying a business or popping up, you're more than welcome. Just um, reach me at uh, Tanisha at ClevelandFresh.com. Uh, I think for me, I think we're at the kind of precipice of a tremendous opportunity to revision the West Side Market. Um, but I think two things are really critical for it to be the place that I want it to be. Uh, I think that the board and the transition team, and I think these uh, community conversations are part of that, need to open their doors to people. In this room right now, we've had some great questions about opportunities for entrepreneurs, about access. How can we expand the West Side Market's reach to the East Side to address all of these you know, crazy issues we have around access to fresh, healthy food that's affordable and quality for our communities. So I'm encouraging the board and the transition team to really engage deeply with the Cleveland community around these issues because I think uh, we haven't even looked at the opportunity potential the market has to help us address some of these issues that you're raising. Um, but then it also takes you all when those opportunities are presented to really engage in that process uh, with the board and the transition team. So to me, the market is only going to be as good as the amazing people that are around its table. And I think we need to make sure that there's plenty of seats for everybody. Uh, so this really becomes not just an Ohio City or West Side asset. It is a city and a regional asset that we can all benefit from. Um, but it's going to take, I think, opportunities for collaboration, for raising our voices, for sharing our interests, our perspectives, the vision that we have, what would work for us uh, as an urban farmer, urban grower, uh, and how we could benefit from the market. That to me is the opportunity that's in front of us, um, but it won't be there forever. Uh, and so I think the next couple years are really critical for us all to come together and really figure out what is the vision for this place and how can it serve our entire city and our entire region. First of all, I would just like to say thank you for having me. Ohio's been great. And then also just support public markets. Um, I say it all the time, where you get your food from, that's the nucleus of health that you have outside of your mother's body. And it is very important that we invest in those places, that we invest in the businesses that pour into those places and making sure that we have wraparound services for the people in the community that are shopping there, but then also the businesses that are sustaining that place and making it so special and accessible to those who are in the community. So continue to support, and that's my advocacy for small businesses that are working markets. Um, I'm a nice vintage millennial, so if everybody can pull out their phones and follow us on Instagram, <laughs> we are at market, the number seven DC on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so please feel free to follow us and follow our story. Um, and if you're ever in DC, listen, Come on back. Um, I just like to again say thank you for the opportunity, and I guess um, ending ending thoughts would be. Um, and, and I, I mentioned this, we had a pre-call, and, and I, I always try to share this with groups because I think it's pretty cool, and I, and I don't think it happens everywhere. Um, but intention is really important when you're creating a space or recreating a space, or especially when you're trying to bring people together. And um, I'm not really sure what the magic is at the Flint Farmer's Market, but it's there. there there's magic. And 
What I often say to people is I, I ask people, like, how many people walk through their workplace and someone tells them that they love them? How often does that happen? It happens every day at our market. It happens all the time. And it's not without struggle, and it's not that sometimes they're not saying other things besides I love you. <laughs> um, but, but we spend an awful lot of time um, as a family, as a market family, um, the rest of my staff, we have a small staff, but they're always saying that like 60% of my job is social worker, probably true. Um, young entrepreneurs, um, people that are trying to get their business going, farmers, there are so many things um, that can get them down so easily. And so I think I would just say, um, just bringing your community together and giving everyone sort of a seat at the table, but really listening to each other, um, having fun with each other, and sharing like life experiences, that transfers over to it being a wonderful place for people to come. It makes people happy. I walked through, our, I was in our market on Saturday and just like constant laughter, people who didn't know each other. You have, you know, a, a homeless person sitting next to a millionaire in our, in our atrium every day. And people interact and they, they love each other, they talk to each other, and it's pretty cool. And like I said, the, I didn't create the magic, it was already there, but I noticed it. And, and it, it is intentional to work hard to keep doing that and bringing new people in. So I'm excited for your market and excited for your town and, and just really appreciate that opportunity. And come see Flint, you'll be surprised. <laughs> you'll be surprised. Um, but we're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays all year round. Um, and there's some great, great other um, cultural center and other fun things to do in our town. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, and www.flintfarmersmarket.com. <laughs> and follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all those good things. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator, our lovely panelists. Let's see. There's still plenty of food, so don't rush out. Grab something to eat. I also want to just close by thanking PNC Foundation. They're our sponsor for this series, and you know, every single one of these, we learned something. So thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you.